Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome back to the uh, last scientific presentations for this three days users meeting. Uh, I want to thank you all for staying with us till the last day. And uh, now your patience will be rewarded by an additional three fantastic uh, talks. The first one will be given by uh, Dr. Bing Ren from UC San Diego, who has really made many, many uh, seminal contributions to the field of epigenomics and the 3D genome organization. So today, he's going to tell us something about the uh, organization and the regulation of human genome. Bing? Thank you very much, Feng, for that kind introduction. Uh, you, you set up the expectation too high. I, I want to lower it. Um, so uh, you, I want to congratulate you for staying here for three days, and it's tough. I know it's a lot of information, so uh, I, I'd like to... Uh, uh, I don't want to give you more information, but want to uh, uh, say what will lie ahead of us after, say, uh, we've uh, managed to find all the functional elements in the genome. And uh, that is to understand the organization and the regulation of the human genome. Uh, the question starts from these charts, and H put together very nice charts of uh, uh, many uh, genome-wide association studies. Uh, it's growing, and now uh, we have the Precision Medicine Initiative that is going to uh, give us more uh, sequence variants linked to human um, disease. Uh, the good news is we'll have more and more uh, such uh, information in hand very soon. The bad news is still that we have uh, not much information to interpret the function of uh, this kind of uh, non-coding variants, and that's because majority of the human genome are not coding for proteins, uh, and interpreting their function has um, uh, still uh, been a major challenge. You have heard over the last couple of days um, the efforts um, by the ENCODE consortium in decoding functional elements in the genome. Um, my lab and many others have been focused on the uh, cis regulatory sequences, uh, the function of which is to control transcriptional um, output of the genome. And these we classified into uh, promoters, enhancers, and insulator elements uh, that carry out uh, their own distinct functions in the genome. We know there are thousands of uh, promoters driving transcription of a gene, uh, and uh, potentially millions of uh, enhancer sequences uh, link, uh, that uh, modulate activities of a, uh, of a gene in a cell type and tissue uh, and developmental stage specific fashion, um, and also many, many insulator elements uh, whose function is to block transcription of enhancers such that they only work on a limited number of genes. Um, efforts in the last uh, uh, several phases of ENCODE have led to the mapping of uh, uh, such elements in the genome, or at least uh, predicted elements uh, in the genome. It's now recognized that uh, a, a much of the human genome is devoted to such transcriptional regulatory elements. Uh, roughly 13 percent of the genome uh, is uh, likely involved in enhancer function. About 1 percent involved the promoter function, and, uh, um, uh, and in any given cell type, uh, roughly 5 percent of the genome is devoted to uh, transcriptional control of the genes. Um, and this number, even though it may not sound impressive, you, if you consider that only about 1.5 percent of the genome is devoted to protein coding, you now know that transcriptional control is a major part of the genome regulation, genome function. We have now plenty of evidence that enhancers play a major role in regulating cell type um, specific uh, expression patterns of the genes. Uh, this is actually a major concept that came out from the recent studies. There are so many enhancer elements in the genome. Uh, prior to the effort of ENCODE, if you ask anyone about how, uh, what elements are controlling transcription, most people will tell you it's the promoter. And in fact, many clinicians to today will still use promoters to drive tissue-specific gene expression. Uh, 
And I think uh, the study of the ENCODE have uh, put that concept uh, completely uh, uh, outside, and now we recognize that if you are interested in tissue-specific regulation of genes, you better look far away from the promoter and uh, focus on enhancer sequences. And by studying, uh, identifying tissue-specific enhancer elements, we can now determine uh, transcription regulatory fat pathways controlling uh, lineage specification, controlling uh, developmental pathways um, by examining uh, transcription factor binding sites in the genome. And it's frequent that these binding sites of transcription factors harbor mutations of uh, genes, um, harbor mutations that link to human disease. And numerous examples have now been provided in the literature on this point. What's lying ahead of us? What's to expect in the coming years? I would like to focus on two questions that are related. One is that um, we recognize there are a huge number of enhancers in the genome, um, but how do they work? What genes do they control? Um, and that is still an unanswered question, uh, and it's uh, both from the basic uh, mechanism point of view and also from practical point of view of finding what genes they control. Um, and once you find a candidate elements that harbor mutations of a disease, the frequently uh, asked question is, what, which gene is this element uh, controlling? Uh, and that is because many such elements are located uh, in the middle of uh, uh, a desert or in the middle of many genes, uh, and it's not always clear which gene such element is controlling. So when you have a mutation in such an element, uh, you are, are still wondering, left wondering uh, what its uh, consequence in terms of function. Now let's briefly review how enhancers work. This is summarizing many years of research, biochemical, genetic, and uh, uh, genomic data. Now we recognize that uh, the first step of enhancers uh, is uh, function or activation uh, begins with the binding of pioneering factors to chromosomal DNA that recruit chromatin remodelers that leads to the modification of nucleosome and eviction of nucleosomes um, on the binding sites. And that we call primed enhancer. And that leads to uh, exposure of uh, 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 transcription factor binding sites that are uh, further uh, occupied by additional transcription factors uh, and recruitment of additional chromatory modelers. And during that process, a key step takes place, and that is uh, that brings enhancer to the promoter in spatial proximity. We call it loops, or sometimes uh, it may not be a loop. It could just be a, uh, a, re a rearrangement of the chromatin organization such that enhancer and promoters are spatially um, next to each other. And when that happens, uh, promoters become uh, uh, essentially exposed to a whole set of transcription machinery uh, that leads to initiation of the uh, uh, RNA polymerase uh, assembly at the promoter and the transcription uh, taking place. So um, let me give you one example to illustrate this process. Uh, we, in the past several years, have focused on a gene called SOX2 in the mouse embryonic stem cells, and we predicted based upon the chromatin signatures uh, that there is an enhancer next door about 130 kilobase away that might be important for SOX2 regulation. And you can see that the promoter of SOX2 is lying uh, about 130 kilobase away from this uh, sequence that is occupied by a number of uh, uh, transcription co-activator proteins, uh, histone-modifying uh, markers uh, that uh, is a telltale sign of active enhancers such as K4 monomethylation and K27 acylation. And if you knock out this sequence, what you find is that if you knock out from the sequence from both allele, SOX2 transcription is down from both allele. If you knock down transcript uh, of this enhancer from one allele, uh, you can see allele-specific loss of transcription from that allele but not from the other allele, and this is reciprocal. So this series of uh, monolytic 
and the biologic deletion mutants inform us that the enhancer that we identified indeed is controlling SOX2 expression and only SOX2 because you can see genes next door are not affected by such deletions. Now, how does a sequence like the SOX2 enhancer act over 130 kilobase away to control SOX2 expression? And uh, now, we uh, now we generally agree that this is happening because there is a spatial loop that connect SOX2 promoter to the enhancer. But how do we prove this? We pr can prove this from uh, using two alternative and uh, orthogonal uh, strategies. One is called uh, chromatin chromosome conformation capture, um, initially invented by Yuk Decker and has now extended to a multiple, uh, direct, uh, multiple method, one of which is called 4C sick. What this does is you cross-link cells with formaldehyde uh, and then perform a restriction digestion and uh, in situ ligation. This ligation allows DNA fragments that are spatially close to be ligated together, and then you can, uh, you can best circularize these ligated junctions and use a pair of primers to amplify the insert from a restriction uh, digestion site. And this insert uh, can be uh, uh, sequenced and uh, uh, plotted in this fashion. Uh, so basically, uh, the anchor corresponding to the PCR primer here uh, will, uh, will, will basically uh, 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 showing up in the middle here, and uh, its interaction sequences uh, shown as the frequency of interaction uh, will basically uh, are showing either as a uh, on the top as a frequency and the bottom as the uh, heat map showing the uh, p-values. So what this kind of map tells us is that uh, for every sequence that you use as an anchor, what other sequences uh, does it interact with? You can do this experiment using anchors corresponding to the SOX2 promoter, and what you can see is that the enhancer sequence that uh, I just mentioned are showing up as a very strong uh, interactors to the SOX2 uh, promoter, and that is consistent with the model that these two sequences are spatially close despite their long genomic distances. If you delete the enhancer sequence, what happens is such long-range interaction no longer occur, and that indicates that enhancers, one of the major functions is to bring it to the uh, promoter to initiate the transcription uh, of, uh, uh, of the gene. We can use an alternative strategy, orthogonal strategy, prove the same point, and that is use uh, fluorescent in situ hybridization. Uh, you can design probes. Uh, usually these are phosmid probes that uh, covers SOX2, covers the enhancer, uh, or cover a sequence further upstream, uh, sorry, further downstream that is of equal distance. And you can basically use a, a, a different colors to uh, label diff each probe with different color, and uh, uh, in 3D microscope, uh, microscopy, you, you can measure this distance uh, quite precisely. And uh, usually, uh, you can measure a population of cell, uh, cells, uh, and this is the average distance between uh, the promoter and the super enhancer, uh, or the super enhancer and the up, uh, downstream control sequences, or promoter and the control. And what I'm showing you here is that in the wild-type cells, the distance between SOX2 and the enhancer is shorter than the sh enhancer and the control, despite that they both have the equal distance. Uh, this al already supports the notion that the enhancer and promoter are similarly, uh, are, are close. And what's also interesting is if you delete this enhancer sequence, the distance between the promoter and the enhancer in general is uh, now uh, much larger, uh, and that distance, that distance is um, statistically uh, similar to what you see from this enhancer to this control sequence. So this proves that indeed um, the, what we call the, uh, the spatial uh, dis, uh, the looping model between enhancer and promoters indeed exist inside the cell. Another point I want to make is that you notice the spread of the distance among these AD cells is actually quite large. What this also tells us is that this, 
spatial distance between enhancer and promoters is not static. It's actually in any given cell population, uh, it is uh, a small population of cells have very close interaction, and then in other pop uh, another uh, fraction of the population, the distance is large and uh, not distant, uh, not uh, statistically uh, uh, different from uh, random uh, controls. Uh, what this implies is that the enhancer work uh, probably on and off to control uh, the uh, promoter activities. Can we use this information of 3D uh, chromatin interaction data to um, uh, infer target genes of, uh, uh, of the enhancer? And that's what I would like to show you. Um, thanks to uh, Job Decker and uh, Arez Lieberman in 2009, uh, a technology called HiC was invented that allow you to investigate DNA-DNA uh, interactions in a genome-wide fashion using uh, the high super DNA sequencing technology. The idea again was to fix the cells with formaldehyde and then digest the DNA in situ and then ligate the uh, uh, loosen up DNA ends uh, and then sequence those ligation junction ligation product with um, high super DNA sequencing machine. Uh, and you can generate uh, hundreds of millions or billions of such paired end reads. Uh, and when you process those reads, you can obtain a, a heat map of frequency of in ligation product between any pairs of DNA along uh, each chromosome. And this is shown up here as a heat map. And uh, if you zoom into this block and turn 45 degree, you will see this heat map as such um, triangular shaped uh, heat maps. And this is not random, a, a general uniform distributed heat map, but rather a triangular shaped heat map. What this implies immediately is that the chromatin uh, is uh, folded into a um, domain-like structure, and each domain corresponds to this triangle, uh, and the size of each domain is roughly a million base pairs. And we, divide, we can devise method to call the boundaries of this domain uh, and uh, determine where they are. Uh, in general, we found that there are 2,000 such domains in the genome uh, in any given human cell type. And we call those domains topologically associating domain. And we have since mapped uh, such uh, chromatin interaction maps in over uh, dozens of, uh, uh, several dozen uh, human uh, primary cells and uh, human tissues. And one thing you can immediately appreciate is that that uh, such topologically associating domains are generally invariant across uh, diverse tissues and cell types. Um, and this is a uh, statistics basically over, if you compare seven primary cells, uh, over 50% of domain boundaries are shared in uh, all seven. And if you look at only those uh, cell type specific boundaries, uh, less than uh, around 10% are such cell type specific boundaries. So this uh, indicates that majority of the topologically associating domains are uh, generally cell type invariant. Similar picture emerge also if you compare all the primary tissues that we investigated. Um, about 14 different tissues were uh, investigated corresponding to the ectoderm, endoderm, and the mesoderm uh, tissues. And again, you can see that uh, nearly 50% of the topologically associating domain boundaries are uh, shared by all 14 tissues, uh, and only about 10% are cell type or tissue specific. So this immediately raised uh, the question whether topologically domain, uh, th this TADs uh, are functional. And there has now a, a lot of evidence supporting the, uh, uh, the notion that the TADs is a a unit of chromatin folding and also is a functional unit of uh, gene regulation. Uh, while an uh, experiment uh, uh, performed in uh, Stefan Mungelow's lab published last year nicely illustrate uh, such uh, this concept, they discovered that uh, in a f several family of uh, uh, human patients with uh, such uh, limb developmental disorders, uh, th the patients carry a, a genomic uh, deletion that all, in all three cases, happen at the topologically domain boundaries. Uh, and basically, in, for example, in this Brachyldactyly patient, uh, the deletion 
uh, led to the uh, expedition of the uh, EPH4A enhancer with a uh, developmental regulator uh, known as uh, PAX3. Uh, and that led to the ectopic expression of PAX3 in limb uh, and caused this uh, uh, brachial dactyly phenotype. A uh, similar story uh, can be t told in uh, uh, two other cases, uh, each share uh, the same feature that a topologically associating domain boundary was deleted, causing new uh, gene expression patterns uh, that result in a limb developmental disorder. How does this happen? It's now recognized that uh, CDCF, uh, uh, zinc finger DNA binding uh, domain containing factors, plays an essential role in the formation of the TAD. Uh, it binds to zinc finger binding sites, or, sorry, CTCF binding sites, and they hold two um, end of the topologically domain together, either as a handcuff or, uh, or in this more dynamic uh, chromosome extrusion model. Basically, when these two CTCF binding proteins uh, uh, binds together and they also form dimers in space, uh, this domain can form uh, and uh, allowing enhancers within the domain to interact with promoters within the same domain, but not uh, outside of the domain. And uh, um, within each topologically associating domains, we can see a lot of enhancer promoter interactions. And we now know that such interactions are generally transient and uh, uh, can be uh, a variable among cell populations. Um, and uh, our uh, task is can we identify such transient and yet uh, 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 frequent interactions between enhancer and promoters. Uh, we uh, had our first attempt in, uh, several years ago by um, applying high c to a human fibroblast cell, but with extreme deep sequencing. And, uh, and we identify regions that uh, basically interact with a, uh, every anchor DNA along the genome. And we can see that uh, for, uh, for a piece of DNA such as promoters, there are nearby sequences that interact with this promoter at higher frequency than expected by chance. And we can identify such interactors. And along the genome, we identified over uh, about a, a million interactions uh, involving such uh, significant interactions. On average, the, um, uh, the distance between uh, each pair of interactors uh, is about 160 kilobase. Um, uh, and this gave us the first map of uh, chromatin interactome in the human cell. But it involves, uh, require a lot of sequencing, billions of sequencing, uh, and thousands of uh, dollars of sequencing. We have been trying to find a way to reduce the cost such that we can apply this to many different cell types and tissues. And to, the, to that purpose, we have now adopted a capture sequencing technique. We designed uh, capture probes for uh, each of the 20,000 promoters in the human genome. For each promoter, we designed uh, uh, 12 uh, capture probes uh, that are uh, basically biotinulated RNA oligos, um, and we use it to hybridize to the high uh, C DNA library uh, and uh, sequence the resulting uh, captured DNA. This is uh, using similar protocol uh, with modification that was published by Peter Fraser's lab, Doc Higgs' lab, and uh, uh, Ricard Sandberg's lab. Uh, and uh, when we apply this strategy to the uh, fibroblast cell, uh, you can see the top is the uh, high C uh, full data sets from uh, uh, 1.6 billion uh, unique paired and reads. And what's bottom is uh, from uh, one tenth of that number of reads, 160 million reads. Um, uh, but when you look at each promoter uh, centric interactions, uh, the, uh, what we found is this nicely capture what you actually see in the genome wide scale. But this comes at uh, about one-tenth the cost. Uh, that gave us uh, the ability now using the uh, to, same tool to investigate uh, all the tissues that we have in hand. Um, and basically, we apply this to uh, uh, roughly 27 cell and uh, uh, primary tissue types uh, that uh, correspond to both embryonic cell lineages and ectoderm, endoderm, and the mesoderm lineages in the uh, adult. Um, just to a summary, what we have uh, learned 
uh, we, out of this 27 uh, tissue capture high C, uh, we identified uh, nearly 700,000 unique interactions centered on promoters at a resolution roughly five kilobase because we're using a restricting enzyme that cut every five kilobase. Average interaction distance is roughly 200 kilobase. Um, a lot of the interactors involve promoter enhancer uh, and uh, nearly half involve promoters and uh, other uh, regions that are not marked, uh, which potentially provide information on new kind of uh, in, uh, uh, regulatory sequences. Uh, many we also discovered are involving promoter promoter interactions. Again, this is cons uh, consistent with what uh, Eugene Ren's lab uh, and uh, Mike Snyder's lab uh, reported uh, in 2013 about extensive promoter promoter networks. Um, what does this map tell us? First of all, we uh, we want to make sure that we are capturing functional interactions, and we compare this interaction map with uh, eQTLs. Uh, EQTLs uh, are, are those that basically you can use genetic means to identify uh, uh, sequence variants correlated with uh, uh, transcription uh, and potentially driver uh, of the uh, transcription of genes. When we compare this, we found that a large number of EQTLs are captured by our protein, protein, uh, sorry, promoter centric uh, interaction maps. By control, this is what you would expect. So this indicates clearly that what we are capturing are a set of uh, highly interacting uh, functional um, enhancer promoter interactions. Another example we, uh, we can identify is the unknown uh, enhancer promoter interactions reported in the literature uh, that involve the uh, FTO gene um, that uh, is linked to the, uh, uh, the, the uh, obesity. So this actually not a this is SNP that has been linked to obesity and its targeting has actually over the years been figured out to be not at FTO but uh, located several uh, hundred kilobase away uh, in, involving two genes IRX3 and IRX5. So when we examined our map of uh, enhancer uh, was promoter centric interaction maps, we can see clearly IRX3 and IRX5 to be linked both to the FTO. Uh, SNP. So, um, so basically this gave us in a lot of confidence that the maps that we generated could be useful for interpreting non-coding variant in human disease. And we then apply this to, uh, the, um, uh, to a set of uh, GWAS uh, SNPs involved in the brain disorders. Uh, there are 900 such GWAS uh, that have been reported in the literature. Uh, and we try to determine what are the uh, genes that they might be engaged. If you just look at their nearest gene, there are about 320. But if you use our maps, you can actually find about 1,700 uh, that are uh, linked to them. So from the long-range looping interaction maps, we can see that um, um, the, uh, the, we can identify a much larger set of genes that potentially could be engaged in uh, such brain disorders. Uh, and uh, these genes, if you do go analysis, you can find many um, uh, enrichment of um, uh, developmental uh, patterning and uh, embryonic skeletal system development uh, and anterior posterior pattern formation. So this gave us a potential new list of genes to investigate and uh, uh, formulate new hypothesis for interrogation uh, further on. Uh, to close, uh, what we have now is uh, a paradigm to understand how non-coding variants control gene expression. Uh, we have, uh, now thanks to ENCODE, we have now maps uh, uh, of uh, cis-regulatory elements where we can uh, generate hypotheses uh, which, whether the SNP is affecting a cis-regulatory elements. Now with a promoter-centric chromatin interacting maps, we can link such sequence variants to candidate target genes and to design experiment to test whether they have um, uh, functions. Uh, there are, of course, a large number of, uh, a lot of questions raised by this kind of studies. Uh, we now have the means now to ask, answer them. Uh, for example, we can uh, determine, do the identified cis-regulatory element 
control uh, the transcription of those candidate target genes and do the SNPs actually affect binding of certain transcription factors and uh, result in alteration of target gene expression. I'd like to end by thanking my colleagues involved in this study. Uh, the TAD uh, was discovered by two former graduate students, uh, Jesse Dixon, who is now a fellow at Salk Institute, and Siddhar Salvaraj, who is starting a company um, focusing on uh, facing of the genome using HiC data. Um, chromatin interaction maps were generated uh, by Fulai Jing in my lab, who is now leading a lab in uh, Case Western, um, and, uh, uh, and the more capture, high s uh, capture sequencing data was uh, the work by a uh, graduate student, Anthony, uh, and in Kiang, um, a postdoctoral fellow in the lab, uh, and these are, um, uh, we, we can't do this without our funders, uh, specifically uh, the ENCODE epigenome roadmap uh, and uh, the Ludwig Institute for Cancer Research. Thank you very much for your attention and I'd be happy to answer your questions. Uh, hi, it's an uh, incredible and super nice talk. I'm really uh, amazed about your work. Um, I'm so surprised what you said that the TAD boundaries are more or less cell type independent. But then I, I would thought that the chromatin structure would uh, play a really important role in differentiation and salt uh, differentiation. So, how do you how do you explain that? Uh, aren't you surprised about that? So uh, they are consistent because uh, chromatin interactions with uh, engaging enhancement promoters typically happen within the general confine of TADs, but TADs are defined not by promoter enhancer interaction at least. I don't believe, but it's more defined by the CDCF DNA interactions and cohesion association with TADs. So you, uh, during development, you form the TADs, and that structure is uh, essentially uh, define uh, what enhancer and what gene are interacting. And that interaction is transient, and it's drawn cell type specific, uh, but that typically happens within this general confine. Second question is more practical. Um, you said you have this uh, this chromatin maps for many cell types. Yes. Do you have it for um, uh, adult heart uh, tissue? We do. We do. We have that for uh, for uh, ventricle mm -hmm. uh, tissues. Is it available online? Uh, we are writing up, and uh, hopefully we'll get it published uh, very soon. Yeah. Thank you. That was extraordinarily lucid. Sorry. Where are you? Okay. Here. Right here. Yeah. Extraordinarily lucid, and therefore, I'm sure we all have a million questions about what you have said, about, particularly about the looping model of the regulation of the genes. But uh, since TADs as are invariant between the cell types, they obviously probably have universal uh, features which yeah. govern chromosome packing and, and, and the interactions as such. Uh, so one would therefore have to think about 13% of the enhancers regulating uh, 22,000 genes, let's assume that, and uh, a few microRNAs here and there. Uh, so do you envisage that one enhancer, one loop, interacts with multiple promoters at one time, number one, and number two, uh, are, is, there, is there something missing, which I don't know where to put my finger on, uh, uh, because the number of the loops that we already know of is extraordinarily limited. Maybe we can count those genes on our fingers. Uh, would you comment on this pre prior knowledge that we only know about loops in only three or four genes, and uh, the examples which you have already given? And the second one is, does an enhancer therefore control a multiple set of genes uh, uh, physically, I'm talking about a physical loop controls multiple genes. Yeah, so this is a very good point, and they touch upon the very basic question about how enhancer work. And from year, decades of research, we now know that enhancer can uh, interact with multiple promoters, um, not simultaneously, but potentially sequentially. Uh, and uh, there, a very nice example was provided by Gerd Blobel. They can demonstrate forced loop interactions between uh, beta-globin LCR with two actually promoters, 
Um, and actually, it can happen in the same cell type, same po cell population, but most likely because they can basically, the loop can happen a fraction of the time here, a fraction of the time there, but they don't happen simultaneously. So, so this is the general understanding of how enhancer work. Um, and when we say loop, I, I actually want to stay step one step back. I don't want to call them loop because loop imply there is some extrusion outside that don't interact with anything. We don't have so far any evidence uh, that there is such um, a protrusion. Uh, th this may exist, but uh, I think uh, it's better to stay to say their enhancer and promoters are close and what happened in the intervening sequence, we don't know. Um, I think that requires higher resolution analysis. Um, and I, I do think that we have to keep in mind such interactions is not sta static. Such interactions are uh, uh, always happen in and out. Just like we individuals move uh, constantly, enhancers and promoters do move constantly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for this talk. I think that we, you all make it uh, sound so easy, which is why my next question is, um, uh, uh, by using that uh, promoter capture IC method, what, how, how low did the price get, or how much sequencing do you have to do to run experiments so I can think about budgeting for that? And uh -huh. Yeah, yes, yeah. So we basically, if you want to do the full high C with about uh, kilobase resolution, you, you need about six billion um, so that, I mean, paired and reads I mean, to achieve that. I mean, uh, now with promoter capture, you, you, you can probably lower that by uh, to about 10 percent. So uh, you can do the calculation. Uh, six billion is about twenty thousand dollars. Now you can expect ten to uh, one thousand to two thousand per capture high C experiment to give you the same resolution as you would with uh, the full high C in depth analysis. Thank you. Sure. Um, okay. One, uh, one last. Uh, that the enhancers can be interacting with different genes, yeah. but within the cel same cell at yeah. different time point, po at different time points. Yeah. So. Uh, <coughs> doing the promoter high C, am I missing? Am I am I missing some some events that's not happening at that at that time point where where the cross linking was done? So we are capturing some interactions and maybe perhaps missing some. So the idea is that we are looking at millions of cells. So so hopefully we are capturing a snapshot of happen what's happening for that promoter across. Uh, a spectrum of time, but y you are right. If you are if you are interested in a temporal uh, uh, events that happen, for example, six hour after you induce the cell to uh, to do something, uh, and that's 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 where I think uh, such temporal dimension needs to be uh, considered, um, and we'll have to do a temporal um, time course. Thank you very much for your attention.